Hello everyone, it's October 13, 2011, 10.13, and of course it's almost 10 a.m. We've got the two clocks here, the Linux clock on the left, Windows clock on the right. Uh, synchronization for the last four days now, I think, has been quite difficult and almost impossible. It takes about half an hour to synchronize. However, I've discovered that this is a problem to do with Linux itself. Um, Whereas a Windows machine it will take a while to synchronize, it will actually synchronize to approximately the right time, according to my <laughs> Casio clock. Whereas the Linux machine, for whatever reason, will actually synchronize it currently about 28 seconds behind the Casio watch. And even the virtual machine, even the Windows virtual machine inside a Linux machine is doing that as well. So I guess this is something to do with uh, the internet protocol or the internet um, the software used to uh, connect to the internet on Linux. There's a little bug there which seems to be not synchronizing or not handling the whatever's going on with the time servers at the moment. But it does form an interesting pattern on the on the charts. Anyway, as you can see Actually, this is correct time at the moment, and so I don't have the camera, so I can't give you an example. But uh, it's showing basically two seconds behind the Casio, which is at where it should be. But if we wait for a little bit, we'll find that these actually sync up again, and this one will be back to the time of this one. Okay, so now the clocks have synced up again and they're actually sitting 28 seconds behind the same as they were last night if we have a quick look at the clock charts as you can see is on the lead up to the 26 the clocks were all slowing down according to internet server time readings and 26 of course was the date that Alan was due to pass between the earth and the sun however if you plot these clock times on a chart that only looks at the difference between the various clocks and the Casio watch in other words, removing the internet server time, we see that actually the clocks are relatively stable leading up to the 26th. But on the 26th, there was a jump in the fastest clock and a dip in the slowest clock. And these are cube clocks. The red one's a cube clock. Uh, the yellow one is actually my long standing cube clock. Uh, the pink one is also one of the new cube clocks. And the blue one is the slowest of these new cube clocks. These other more horizontal lines are these other clocks which have been designed to mount on a car dashboard. And one of them actually is almost exactly uh, in line with the Casio. It doesn't move at all. It's as accurate as the Casio is. Um, but they've all been, all these ones have been adjusted to compensate for their speed. Um, I'm normalizing this because if this was actually not normalized, it'd be a very steep line going up this way, and this one would be a steep line going down this way. However, one thing you'll notice is the fastest clock and the slowest clock form virtual mirror images of each other. It's not perfect, but it's very close. For example, on the 26th, the fastest clock has a peak, as the slowest clock has a dip. And as the fastest clock gets faster, the slowest clock gets slower. And as the rate of the fastest clock drops, the rate of the slowest clock increases. But it, again, this is a little bit of a distortion, though, because I've got these normalized. so it wouldn't be so obvious because if I didn't normalize these they'd form very straight lines at very steep angles but it's still it's an interesting observation so although the apparent movement in the clock time is relative to the internet server time it seems to be the result of a bug in Linux networking causing the synchronization algorithm to exaggerate rather than minimize the synchronization problem it does seem to be a leading indicator to real movements in the clocks and at the moment the discrepancy in internet server times has reached a maximum. In fact, this is the worst it's ever been in the time I've been doing this clock experiment. So whether or not we're going to see a big movement in the clocks coming up in the next day or two, I don't know. But we do seem to have reached a peak in this synchronization problem. So what's been happening with the earthquakes? Well, for the last month or so, we've been down to levels which are equivalent to what we experienced back in 1963, 48 years ago. The number of earthquakes and the amount of energy being released is really at a almost all-time low. And that in itself is also unusual. Now if Elonen, or an object like Elonen, had been responsible for previous earthquakes, especially between Earth, Sun and Elonen, or Earth, Moon and Elonen, you would expect when Elonen got past 
the Earth and it formed another alignment. If this theory is correct about parallel alignments between the Moon and Earth and the tail of this comet or comets, you would expect that as the Moon came round to another parallel alignment you might have a slowdown in clock speeds and a subsequent earthquake on the next major alignment which would be the Jupiter alignment. And looking back at the clock chart comparing the clock speeds to the Casio if we take just the original cube clock it does seem to indicate that we may be on a charging sequence over the last few days however it's not really indicated on these other ones I'd expect especially the slow clock to have reversed by now and it hasn't however we have had two significant earthquakes within seven hours of the Jupiter alignment south of Bali a 6.1 at 3.16 UTC and off the coast of Oregon a 5.3 at uh, 4.13 UTC let's have a look at the one off Oregon let's have a look at the latest seismographs for these two quakes and we can scroll down you see it's not it's big but it's not big by standards of the last few months if you like and it's felt quite strongly, the one in Indonesia is felt quite strongly in the Philippines obviously and the one in Oregon here's the seismograph for Oregon and it was actually first listed as a 5.9 as you see there's a really big spike there so it was quite a big, it was a short sharp jolt and although it was listed now as a 5.3 I do happen to have browser window still open <laughs> with the original listing. 5.9, there you go, off the coast of Oregon. So it was first, this is 5.9, downgraded quite heavily to a 5.3. So given that we're not quite at the Jupiter alignment yet, there's a few more hours to go, uh, and we've already had two, six or thereabouts earthquakes there could be more to come and of course it doesn't happen until later today and we're also very close to the Sun Earth Jupiter alignment so that might make this more potent I don't expect anything massive to happen but I would expect a maybe even bigger spike than we've got now at least as high as some of these perhaps since it's already begun so early so this is the position of the moon for the Indonesian earthquake and for the one off the coast of Oregon the moon was here. And if we just speed that up, you can see we've still got a few hours to go. Up until 3 p.m. UTC is about the peak of that alignment. So what I think we've been looking at since April of this year is not just one object coming around the sun and heading off. We already know there's more than one object with Ellen and it's been on various images and videos showing at least two and possibly three other objects, one almost the size of Ellen accompanying Alanin. So it's quite reasonable to assume there might be other objects ahead and behind of Alanin. Maybe Alanin is the largest, maybe it's not. Maybe the largest object, and I would assume the largest object would be the lead object, in which case the lead object is already long gone. But And it might have actually passed us on September 2nd. Uh, that was the time the clock jumped, which I've got here, uh, just to show that alignment here. When the Earth was here, the lead object might have been just passing between us and the Sun at that moment which would put it perhaps somewhere over here now which is the date of the Kermitic Islands earthquake last week following that line of thought we also had other earthquakes on the Kermitic Islands back here which of course occurred too early but if that object was coming through, if that was the lead object and this Earth-Moon alignment, this is the Earth here at that point on July 6 and the moon is on this side of the earth that alignment with an object that was actually ahead of Alan would fit that and I've plotted a few of these alignments with the earth and moon to other earthquakes that don't really fit the main patterns and it sort of suggests there could have been an object passing through at that point ahead if you had a stream of objects coming in in a coherent unit or at least in a line heading into the Sun from this direction. As you pass through that, 
there'd be a stream of energy going from the sun out down those tails. And the, as a coherent unit, they'd form this massive tail. We pass through that energy stream. And then we got the big earthquakes, like the Chilean earthquake in February 27, 2010, and the March 11 earthquake this year in Japan. However, as these objects start to go around the sun, they're no longer a coherent unit. Some end up over this side of the sun, while some are over this side of the sun. Of course, as they come around the sun, the original tail that they had, that may go off to the edge of the solar system and beyond, is actually now having to curl around the sun. So you can't imagine much energy flowing down that anymore. Not only that, we've got the CMEs. If these were hit by CMEs, they'd probably throw the tail off completely. So you now got just these plain rocks flying around, basically, until they get to a point where they're growing another tail. It's going to take a bit of time. It's going to take the solar wind's time to blow that debris out or dust off them so they can have a conduit for more energy to flow. However, as these objects come around the sun and they start heading off towards the Pleiades, Orion sort of direction, they will now be in a line again. And once they're in a line with the long tails heading off to the edge of the solar system, then we could have problems yet again with earthquakes. And I wouldn't expect that to happen until November 22nd, which is the next alignment with Elenin. But if Elenin's only the central object, it's not the lead object, it's not the trailing object, it's just one of a whole lot of rocks that came through. Maybe it used to be a great comet once, but it's not now. Whatever it is, it's in fragments. And that's in my opinion anyway. And it's getting very close to the Jupiter alignment. And interestingly, we've also got the Pleiades alignment. This will be the position of these objects on the 22nd. They'll be in the alignment of the Pleiades, which is also a common earthquake alignment. And the tails will be all heading off basically towards the Pleiades, or that direction. And the Earth will be in between the whole bunch. I think in the end we're going to find that November 22nd is a much more significant date for these earthquakes than September 26 was. However, it's hard to imagine it being as bad as March 11 of this year because on March 11 they were still on their way in. They hadn't been disrupted by the sun. They hadn't been dispersed in any way. They had very long tails. They were at a very different charge state from the sun. So the sun would have been passing a lot of energy down that line has got very different potentials and energy. Whereas at this time, on November 22nd, the difference in potential energy coming from the sun to the location of these objects and maybe down to the end of their tails is going to be significantly less. But of course, November 22nd would be a date to be cautious about. And of course, where will the moon be on November 22nd? Well, it turns out the new moon is on November 25. So it's three days before the new moon. So let's have a look at what November 22nd looks like in Celestia. First we go back to the Sun, and we look back at from the Sun towards the Earth. And as you can see we've got the Earth here, Alanin and perhaps its companions all traveling off the direction of the Pleiades. So we'll just zoom into the Earth and see what it looks like as we come in. As you see, the moon, if we come back out a bit, you can see the moon is swinging round, getting close to the new moon. So that's the 22nd, and I'll let this run a little bit, and you can see the moon swing round on the date 23rd, 24th. So the perfect alignment perhaps will be coming in around November 25. Here just here's one example of uh, images showing multiple objects with Elenin. Here's Elenin supposedly, here's one of its companion objects, and here is another smaller companion object. Okay, so I'm just going to end this video here, and I'll just do a quick refresh of the earthquakes. I don't think there's anything significant yet. And the live servers pretty much as they were. 
You can see Taiwan showed a big movement actually on that Indonesian quake. Western Australia, very close to Indonesia. But nothing like a big earth wobble event. And I wouldn't expect to see anything like that at the moment. Not until we get closer to November, uh, late November. Okay, so thank you for watching. And uh, hopefully nothing major does happen, but I don't expect anything major. Maybe another six. And that'll be it for the moment. Thank you for watching and talk to you again.